Hello, and th thank you guys for having me today. Just fresh off the red eye, so fresh as a daisy right now. So I wanted to talk to you guys about um, <clears throat> a few lessons that I learned throughout my life and, and, and throughout my career. Um, a little bit about me. West Philadelphia, born and raised. <laughs> Our playgrounds looked a little bit different from Fresh Prince's, though. Um, but I grew up in West Philly, uh, hip-hop head, a kid who just fell in love with music from a very early age. So from the time I was about 10 or 11, I would start buying records here and there, borrow my friend's records, borrow my, my cousin's records. I would read every single liner note. I would know every recording studio, every engineer. I was kind of like the rain man of hip hop and uh, being able to spit back every single thing there is to know. It just was something I was obsessed with from a, a really early age. And I used that as a form of, es of escapism. We, uh, we grew up pretty poor growing up, single mom. We lived over top of a small uh, hardware store in West Philly. Um, my dad had gone to prison when I was seven and a half years old for, for murder. And, um, and was in jail for about 12 years until I was about 20 years old. So basically my mom raised me and my two younger brothers, my uh, one older brother, one younger brother. And, um, and basically we learned a lot from just the neighborhood and the streets. Uh, in ninth grade, because I love music, I had this big idea that I was gonna form a rap group with my best friend that I met in class named Jazz. And um, the rap group was called Too Too Many because we only used to have money. To, uh, it was three of us, we only had money for one of us. So it was always Too Too Many. And at that age, my best friend taught me this idea about how thoughts become things. And he had this thing, if we ever meet uh, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, those guys are gonna give us a record deal. And we worked hard at our music, so hard, <clears throat> that in 11th grade, I actually dropped out of school. And my mom was pissed. And uh, she basically took me, dragged me to this center called Job Corps, and said, you're going to get uh, a GED, and you're going to come home with a piece of paper. And if you want to do music, you got to graduate first. And for those of you guys who don't know Job Corps, it's kind of like uh, jail meets college. And it was on the old naval base in Port Deposit, Maryland. And, um, and I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. So within record time, I got my GED. I went back uh, out to Philly and started working on my music again. And this is actually the train that we used to take downtown every single day. And we used to uh, hop the turnstiles because we didn't have money to get on the train and wait outside at DJ Jazzy Jeff's studio every single day. We waited out there in the cold. We waited out there in the rain. And then um, finally one day, uh, we saw friends who just happened to be in a recording studio, and they let us in, and, and we met these guys. Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. So these were like the first successful guys to really make it out of our neighborhood that we grew up in. Um, you know, Will had gone to L.A. to do Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. These guys had won Grammys. They had become big and famous. So it kind of gave us the idea of if they could do it, we absolutely could do it. So we, we snuck into their studio session, popped in our cassette, quickly found out we sucked. But Will saw some potential in us. He gave, gave us a little record deal, um, really respected our hustle. Also, he, you know, we danced for him, showed all, all of our talents, and he said, how are you guys getting home? We said, we have no idea. But he drove us home that night, and he told us, he said, your lives are going to change forever. And, um, and actually, they did, but just not that quickly. We ended up getting, uh, I, we got dropped from our record label, put out a little record, got dropped within like six months. Um, super disappointed because this was like one of the first things that I worked really hard for in my life. I put everything that I could put into it. I sacrificed school, sacrificed my, my, my mom's happiness, and, um, and for this quickly failed rap career. 
But Will saw potential. Jeff saw potential. His manager, James Lassiter, saw potential in these young guys. They gave me a job as an assistant in the recording studio. I, I washed cars for them. I, I uh, picked up homework and for, for their kids. So basically, whatever I could do uh, to get on, I actually did to get on. And then, um, but I hated LA. I moved to LA, hated LA, ended up going back to Philly with my tail between my legs. But it was one of the things that my grandmother said, you can't fall off the floor. When you start from nothing, there's nowhere to go but up. So I went back to Philly. I started promoting shows. Uh, it was like uh, back then promoting shows, there was no Live Nation or big conglomerates, and everybody was scared to do hip-hop shows because they always ended in some act of violence with a fist fight or a gunshot, and it was only like one crazy guy in Philly that was willing to take that on, and it was me. And, um, and I used to collect money from guys in my neighborhood who would help me put together these shows because I didn't have, you know, an investment fund or anything like that. So guys from the neighborhood would actually pull together cash to help me do these little concerts. So they started off at the local YMCA and then uh, got a little bit bigger. I was the first guy to bring Wu-Tang Clan into Philly, uh, a 16-passenger minivan uh, uh, from Staten Island with uh, Method Man and Old Dirty Bastard in the back playing at a local, like, sort of bingo hall. Uh, and the old dirty bastard's leg was broken, so he just rapped like this the whole time. Uh, I actually got fortunate enough, uh, I bought Foxy Brown, a rapper uh, down f uh, from New York, and she bought a guy who she was doing music with down, and it just happened to be Jay-Z. So it was Jay-Z's first concert in Philadelphia. So I was starting to build these relationships. But it was one show that helped shape my life and my career, but it actually was a show that, that, that never happened. So I was doing a show, it was the biggest show to date, and it was at the uh, University of Penn's campus, and, uh, and Notorious B.I.G. was the headliner. And then I get a call that Notorious B.I.G. was not gonna be able to make it down before the show. I'm panicking. I'm nervous, I'm thinking this is gonna be a riot. I get on the phone with his manager and then he puts the head on uh, the label on and he said, we're, at, we're in New York right now shooting a video called Big Papa, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to make it down before it's over. Uh, and we get into a big fight on the phone with the, with the record label and Big doesn't show. But they still come down to Philly and the guy I was arguing with on the phone was P. Diddy. <laughs> so we go to an after party at a club called Fever, and, um, and Puff was like one of the first guys that was, you know, within my age range in the music industry who had a similar background. He lost his dad when, uh, to, to violence as a kid. His dad was killed. And of course, like I said, I lost my dad both come from uh, sim similar backgrounds. And here was a guy who was building this company that I admired. So I'm sitting in the club, I'm watching him hold court, and he's kind of commanding the room. And, um, and I said, you know what? I want to come work for you. He said, okay, I'll give you your first job. Um, get me the girl from behind the bar. So I got him the girl from behind the bar. And two weeks later, I was working for Bad Boy Entertainment. And I was an intern, so basically anything that Puff needed, taking out the trash, doing the marketing plans, worked my way up to uh, uh, the assistant to the president of the company. But I was able to learn a lot because working for Will Smith, I saw the business at 30,000 feet, but working for Puff, it was more hand-to-hand -hand combat, bootstrapping, entrepreneurship, how to do a little with, how, how to do a lot with just a little. And it really, uh, at, that was my training ground for how to, how to become an entrepreneur, and I have to thank him for that. Uh, in in uh, 1999, I got a call from uh, somebody who was from our neighborhood, a girl who I'd known since she was 16, and, uh, and she was just recently 
uh, at that time discovered by Dr. Dre, and she asked if I could help her find a manager. And so I took her to meeting after meeting and meeting after meeting, and finally she said, you know what? After the 11th meeting, she said, why don't you just do it? And of course I said yes. Never, knew, never was a manager before. Uh, was very nervous actually about doing it. How am I going to screw this girl's career up before it actually starts? And, um, but I learned really quick, you fake it till you make it. First day of tour, Cash Money Rough Riders tour, we're getting on the tour bus, and I'm walking up on the bus. It's my first real thing as a manager, and, uh, and it's this old guy who's the bus driver, and he walks on the bus, and he says, uh, you, you got the float? And I say, yeah, I'll be right back. And I get on the phone, and I called up Will, uh, Will Smith's manager, James, and I said, James, what's the float? He said, idiot, it's the money you give the bus driver to pay gas and tolls and buy food. So I, I went back, and I, and I gave him the money, and I said, here's the float. And then I floated my way through the rest of the tour, <laughs> floated my way through for about the next couple of years. But Eve trusted me, and, and the whole thing was I learned about the, how to trust my own instinct, trust my gut. Trust the fact that I'm going to protect my friend who gave me the shot with everything that I have. And we built something special. So over the next few years, you know, we did apparel lines. We did TV shows. Um, I was able to uh, sign some more clients. I ended up uh, building probably one of the, the premier boutique hip-hop talent management companies uh, in the country. And I even uh, made enough money to uh, open up an unfancy office in the basement of a downtown uh, building because I needed the fancy address because I didn't want people to think I still worked out of my apartment. And actually, it, it had no windows. It was like a casino, so you never knew what time of day it was. So you get to work, and next thing you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning when you're coming out. But we built an incredible culture, me and my partner at the time. Uh, we, we signed artists from London. We signed artists from New York. And sooner than later, I got a call. Um, somebody wanted to buy the company. First opportunity to make some real money. Every entrepreneur is looking for that exit, looking to take their business to the next level. And I jumped on it, sold the company, opened up their LA office, moved out, bought a house for my family. And we hear a lot about buyer's remorse uh, but in this case, it was more like seller's remorse. 18 months into the deal, I realized I made the worst mistake of my life. It was painful. Um, while they were doing their diligence on us, I wasn't doing my diligence on them. Uh, I wasn't looking at the culture of their company. I wasn't looking at the quality of people. I wasn't looking at how my career was going to change. And instead of that connection that I had with the clients and that love of music, I was uninspired, and, uh, and I was able to get out of that deal, and I said, I'm going to start a new company. I'm going to take Eve with me. I uh, ended up buying this. I, I rented a fancy office on Wilshire Boulevard, all glass, beautiful, reinvested everything back into the business, had everything planned out. Uh, and then one day, uh, Eve walked in, and she said, um, I think I want to go in another direction. You're fired. You want to talk about devastation, the definition of devastation. Um, somebody who I felt like I invested my career in, my life in, um, somebody who had been at my wedding, somebody who saw my kids grow up, um, somebody I didn't even, I trusted enough, we didn't even have a contract, and, uh, and sort of left me out there high and dry. Um, and it was right as the world was falling apart financially. So no banks were lending, no friends had money, commissions dried up, I had to lay off my staff, notices started coming in the mail, couldn't pay the vendors. But even worse, what was happening at home was falling apart. Um, my house was being foreclosed on where my, my wife and my mother-in-law basically had to pawn their wedding rings to, to, to save my house. 
uh, the, 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 the buzzer on the doors ringing in the middle of the night because uh, the, the banks were repossessing our cars and were co coming in the middle of the night. And I remember sitting down with the head of school at my kid's school, begging him to actually uh, keep the kids in school because I couldn't afford to pay tuition at that time. But I, but I couldn't allow my kids to get kicked out of school. And I remember when the bill came for breakfast, um, wondering whether the credit card was going to go through for a couple of bowls of uh, uh, oatmeal uh, that, that day. And ended up moving out my office. Will and James, you know, I told them what was going on. They said, we have an empty office next to ours right now. Just come and crash here if, if, if you like. And, um, and I remember one day, it was like shortly after the Christmas holiday, it was probably one of the worst Christmases a dad could have. I'm driving down Ventura Boulevard, and, um, and I just pulled over and cried my eyes out. One of, the, not a, one of those ugly cries, it was a really ugly cry, but it was cleansing. And it was just that moment of, you can't fall off the floor. What, what are you going to do? I don't have a plan B. My, my, my dad wasn't part of a country club or didn't work at Goldman Sachs. My mom couldn't call anybody from a sorority. I, I was the sole, I, people in my family depended on me, so, so I had to figure it out. But I also had to have faith and find that quiet place and really learn how to get to that quiet place. One of my mentors told me, you can use failure as a headwind or a tailwind. And this was something that stuck with me for a very, very long time. Because failure breeds fear. And a lot of times, uh, fear paralyzes people. And then you just go into that downward spiral. But how can you use that same exact energy to propel you forward, to make you get out of bed in the morning, to make you fight against uh, wh wh whatever's holding you back? And it's this old story that, you know, I just love. But, you know, it's a, it's a simple parable. It was uh, A and B were, were, were having a fight. And they were in this all-out brawl. Both of them are getting tired. Both of them are knocking each other out. And both of them wanted to quit. A decided to quit. But B decided to throw one last punch. And B won. And how can you treat failure that same exact way? Can you find it in you to throw that one last punch? And for me, sometimes treating people good comes into play. Because I, 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 got, I got a phone call from a very old friend named Vincent Herbert. And Vince is a guy I've known since I was a, a, a little kid getting in the industry. We were the same age. And Vince was this prolific music producer at like 16 or 17. Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, uh, Boys to Men, you name them, Vince produced for them. And Vince and I had never done business together, but I always took his calls, and I always called him, you know, just to check in on him. And Vince called me, and he said, Troy, well, he called me Carter. And uh, he said, Carter, I saw this girl on MySpace. Uh, you guys are probably too young to know what MySpace was. Um but I'm flying her to L.A. tomorrow. I want to bring her by the office, but I think you're going to like her. Make sure you're there. And so Vince is like really, really big guy. So, and with this very uh, soft voice. So the next day I see him coming into the office, and he's, you know, walking in, and behind him appears this girl, and she walks out. She played some music, song after song, hit after hit. She looked nothing like this, by the way. She had these big black sunglasses on, fishnet stockings, no pants. Looked like she landed from another planet. But she was wise and like she knew exactly what she wanted. And she said, I, I want to be the biggest star in the world. And I said, Vince. Make sure you bring this girl back. Like, I love her. Make sure you bring her back. And um, a few months later, 
she came back to L.A. I took her to the fanciest restaurant I could find, um, Spaghetti Warehouse. <laughs> I wasn't balling at that time. And we went to Spaghetti Warehouse. And we sat down for three hours and we talked about life, about career. And, her, and what was interesting, she, she had gotten signed to Def Jam Records and Def Jam dropped her four months after they signed her. And, and this was her dream. She worked all of her life to, to become this superstar. And four months later, she gets dropped from Def Jam Records. She went to West Virginia. She's sleeping on her grandmother's couch. And her grandmother said, get off the couch. <laughs> if you're going to do it, go do it. Her dad said, you got one year or you need to go back to school, but you need to figure this out. So between what was happening in my life, what was happening in her life, we connected in a way that... Um, that you, you, no, you don't usually connect with artists. We connected right away. And, um, and we went out on this journey. And she started writing songs for other people. She wrote songs, you know, for, for Pussycat Doll. She wrote songs for Britney Spears, for this person, for that person. But we couldn't get her career started to save our lives. And it took one year for her first song to get played on the radio. We shopped this thing everywhere. Nobody would play it. They would say uh, it was too European, it was too gay, it was too this, it was too that. And then finally, it was a radio station in Toronto that took a... Toronto, I love you guys. Thank you. Did you request it? <laughs> they played the record. And then, of course, I, I, I hit up the station in Buffalo and said, hey, you know how hot we are in Canada right now? And Buffalo started playing the record. And then other stations started playing the record. And then within a year, uh, Just Dance went to be, become a number one record around the world. But, it didn't, but radio didn't help. And this, is, this was Lady Gaga after. <laughs> what I learned was perseverance. What I learned was, was how, to, how to make that shift. Because at the time in our business, the music industry, we had gone through the worst possible change that we could ever go through. And where we were the canaries in a coal mine when it came to disruption, transformation, and we ignored it. The mecca of the music business was Tower Records. And this is what it looked like. We ignored the customer. The music industry completely ignored what was happening. We stuck our heads in the sand and, and, and completely ignored it. What's interesting, it wasn't that people wanted to steal music. It was the fact that the music industry, we, 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 we had a terrible product, first of all. We charged $17.99 for a CD with two good songs and probably 10 bad songs. It was like a forced bundle. And then we made the packaging so hard to open, you needed a blowtorch and like a jackhammer just to get the, C just to get the CD out. So of course when, when Napster came along and gave you choice of songs and made it easy for you and, and give, it gave you the ability to test it and carry it with you, with, with you on, your, on your new uh, MP3 player, People just, people went for it. It was an early model, but we still didn't listen to the consumer at that particular time. In fact, the music industry is probably the, one of the only industries that sued its customers. That's how bad we were. But here we were with a new artist from a new generation who didn't have any of that historical baggage. And where we also got lucky were guys like this. Because Facebook was coming out of .edu at the time, and all, and all of a sudden democratized communication. YouTube was on the rise. And prior to YouTube, you had to wait for Saturday Night Live to book you. You had to wait for Ellen to call you. You had to wait for Good Morning America to call you. Now all of a sudden you had an audience that could see your personality. And we, we would shoot these sort of uh, flip cam videos of Gaga and her art school friends doing these like weird downtown videos, but we distributed it 
around the world from YouTube for free. And all of a sudden, people started catching on, and radio was late. The gatekeepers were late. Twitter took out all of the middlemen. So all of a sudden, instead, instead of having to go through a publicist, instead of uh, people speaking on your behalf, you can talk directly to the audience. And tech companies paid attention to what we were doing because at that time, there wasn't a bridge between technology and, and, uh, and media companies. They were suing each other. It was this misunderstanding. Uh, the people in LA thought Silicon Valley were pirates uh, and didn't get content. People in Silicon Valley thought that people in LA were dinosaurs and, and, and didn't, and didn't want to move forward, which was right in most of the cases. But, um, but for me, it was an eye-opening experience, and I started getting a lot of phone calls. But one of the lessons I, that I learned was that if, if, you, if you work in a fish store long enough, you stop smelling the fish. You get caught up in your own bubble. And it's important, you got to get out of your own bubble. you got to take have some outside perspective. And working with these technology companies gave me a lot of outside perspective. We get, sometimes you get stuck in your own rut just because um, a lot of our businesses that we are in just have historically do things in a certain way that makes no fucking sense at all. But because it's been done that way, we just continue to do it. So sometimes it takes looking at other businesses, looking at other verticals, and you learn ideas from those other verticals, and that's what we were able to apply to the music industry and really disrupt the music industry uh, from, from, from the inside out. So being able to look for inspiration in other places and other ideas, and for me, technology was one of those fields that, that, uh, that showed me how to do that. And most recently in Spotify, um, I was able to blend those two worlds together. And from those experiences, I've been able to invest in a, in a lot of startups and kind of learn about a lot of different spaces and, and learn from a lot of different types of entrepreneurs. Where Uber and Lyft, investing in those companies, you know, who reinvented transportation, it just showed me how uh, consumer behavior was starting to shift and, that, and how the, we, I needed to pay attention to this generational shift. My generation, we were brought up on stranger danger. You don't get in a car with, a, with another guy. You don't sleep on a stranger's couch. Like, you know, all, all of these things that, that, that we saw very early on in these, in these generational behavior shifts really uh, changed my outlook on how I was looking at things and how I can apply that to my own business. Um, companies like Yumi and Wonder School that we invested in showed me this new category that we, we named uh, the unperfect parent. And this new generation of parents that are different from their own parents. How, 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 are, how behavior is shifting between that generation to the other and what are the opportunities there? Uh, Lend Up and Lind Street were two in, uh, companies that we invested in that's basically bringing dignity back into banking, where banking used to be, about community, about dignified loans, about transparency. And then also, like, one of my favorite categories is just seeing what's been happening in the multicultural space. Because a lot of times, you know, showing up in the valley, it was nobody in the valley that looked like me at all. Where it was, um, in the music industry, it's, it's, it's a lot more diverse than Silicon Valley, and I'm being nice. And, uh, and I learned terms like unconscious bias, which I'm like, that sounds like racism to me. <laughs> new, new name, dress it up, put a bow on it, okay. Fair enough. Um, but companies like, like Maven that we invested in, uh, a, a young entrepreneur from Oakland who basically looked at the beauty industry and saw that uh, African-American uh, women over-index and it's $19 billion in just the hair industry alone in that space. But that's an opportunity that traditional VCs wouldn't see because they, they didn't come from that space. Um, how, how, how do you find entrepreneurs who understand the, the value in investing in different hues? And then us, we're looking at entrepreneurs of different, different hues that are going to understand those opportunities. So that's been a fascinating space that I, I learned a lot from. 
And so I'm learning a lot from these companies, but I think even more, I've, I've learned a lot from observing artists. Um, I learned a lot from watching Gaga, who's better than any CMO that I've ever met in my life. I learned a lot from watching Beyonce, who manages her business and her brand just as well as any Fortune 50 company, by the way. She has a lot in common with Nike, the way she, man she manages the details of, of, of her brand. And then you, and it, it, it's, a, it's something that we're seeing that customers, they're willing to wait in line for. They're saving up their paychecks to make purchases. And, and, and I remember seeing the first 50 fans sleep outside of a show at the Wilton Theater as we were breaking Gaga. I remember seeing girls who were having body shaming issues when we were working with Megan Trainer write her letters and say, hey, you saved my life. And I think a lot of it has to do with authenticity, making that connection, being real as you possibly can be, and, and, and also being able to operate off script in a way where people feel connected to you, whether it's customers or whether it's actual fans. And for me, I've been able to apply that to multiple businesses that I've invested in, being able to, for them to be advocates for you, to be like the Beehive, Beyonce's crew, or Belieber's, Justin Bieber's crew, uh, or whatever Taylor Swift's calling them now, Swift the Knights, whatever. <laughs> but people who are willing to fight your battles for you, you know, how do you build that authentic relationship? How do you make that connection in a way that, that, that feels real to them? Even so loyal that they get really painful tattoos on their forearm. That takes commitment right there. If you could get fans like that, that's willing to do that, that takes, that takes real commitment, that shows a lot of loyalty. For, for me, this has been an incredible learning experience. And whether I'm learning from companies like Nike, where people like this waiting out in line for their shoes, who are really thinking about how do we make that connection. The Colin Kaepernick thing this week was, like to me, that was mind-blowing. That, 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 showed, that showed a company that's willing to take risk. That showed a company that's willing to put it all on the line. That's showing a company that's willing to speak up for, for what they stand for or stand next to somebody who's willing to speak up what they stand for. And for, and for me, a kid from West Philly, that's where my values stand. It's like I'm going to speak my mind and I'm going to tell my truth. And being able to align with artists or align with brands that, that, that do the same exact thing is important. And as marketers and business owners and entrepreneurs, you know, are you finding that truth? I think companies like this, whether it's Nike or whether it's Beyonce or whether it's Gaga, you think about it. They listen. They learn. They got open ears. But you got to be quiet to learn. That's what's hard. We live in an age where there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of opinions. You're going to piss one side off if you say this. But where do you stand? Listening to, to your consumers are important, but I think listening to yourself is even more. One of the challenges that I do have working with technology companies is we live in an age of data, 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 data. I'm like, I'm so sick of the word. I'm, I'm sure we have data scientists in here or people, but in all fairness, what data told Beyonce to pick up her microphone? What data told Phil Knight to build the shoe? What data told John Lennon to write Imagine? There's no data there. I think great ideas, inspiration, songs, inventions, to me it's like they're, they're all downloads from God. There's no data informing you that. So the question is, can you quiet yourself from the noise? Can you quiet yourself from opinion? 
can you move yourself out of the, the, that crutch of, 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 of data? For me, I open myself up to learn that data doesn't lead to creativity. I still trust that same instinct as that kid that got on that train sitting outside of the studio waiting for Will Smith. I still trust that instinct of being able to ask Puffy to, to, to get a job or being smart enough to get him the girl from behind the bar. I don't think they're still together, by the way. But I, but I, but I, but I still trust it, absent of data. I've opened myself up to learn from failure. I opened up myself to learn from the genius of makers. I opened up myself to learn from the flow of artists. And hopefully I'm quiet enough to get that download from God. Thank you.